Hello, everyone, and welcome to the online public meeting for the Bangadar and 9800 South State Environmental Study. We've got people joining us and keeping track here of our attendee list, so we'll give everybody a minute before we really get started. Thanks for taking the time to jump on here tonight. Uh, you'll hear from members of our environmental study team tonight about this initial kind of phase of the state environmental study that we just launched. You'll learn a little bit about what we'll be looking at throughout the study, a look ahead for our schedule and what to expect in terms of next steps, and also how you can provide input to help us inform the process. So we're excited to have you here. We'll be getting started again in just a few minutes. Looks like we've got people still logging on and joining us here tonight. For those of you who are here, I'll give you a little bit of a look ahead about what to expect. We're gonna have a presentation for about 20 minutes or so. After that, we will then go into a question and answer session. So we'll go ahead and try to address any questions that come in throughout the presentation and afterward for the remainder of the meeting until seven o'clock. If for whatever reason we do not get to every question, we have a pretty big group of people here tonight. So if we don't get to every question, there are multiple ways to still get a hold of us and get this information. Um, we have our hotline, our email address that we'll be talking about here a little bit later. And we are also holding an in-person meeting uh, tomorrow night at Elk Ridge Middle School from 6 to 7.30 p.m. So we can definitely catch up with you to answer any outstanding questions as well. Looks like we've got a couple more people on the line. I'll talk a little bit more about that Q&A portion. So tonight we won't be taking uh, questions verbally, but you'll be able to type questions in. If you see at the bottom of your screen there, there's a Q&A box that you can type questions into at any time. Um, we do have a panel of subject matter experts from our study team that are on the line and we'll be ready to address any questions that do come through. So we do wanna point out too, that there is an opportunity to actually like or upvote other questions that you see coming in from the public. Uh, you can do that by clicking on that little thumbs up button next to the question that you see. And by doing that, that will move the question up further in the, uh, the line so that our moderators can read those first. So we can see kind of what the most popular questions are. Looks like we're still having people pop in a little bit. We'll go ahead and give about one more minute till we get a little bit higher on the attendance. Again, thank you for joining us for anybody who just jumped on. Just wanna give you an idea about what to expect for this meeting. We're going to have about a 20 minute presentation followed by a question and answer session. And in our presentation, you're gonna hear from members of our study team about kind of where we're at in this initial phase of the Bangadar 9800 South environmental study. We'll give you some information about what kind of things we'll be looking at throughout the course of the study, the schedule, what to expect for next steps, and then talk a little bit more about how you can provide input to help inform the process. It looks like we've got a pretty good amount of people on, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over first to Brian Allen. He's our UDOT project manager who is overseeing this entire Bangor environmental study effort. Brian? Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Allen. I'm the UDOT project manager overseeing the Bangor environmental studies. I'm joined today with uh, Tyler Allen, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, hey everyone. I'm Tyler Allen, and I'm with UDOT environmental, and I'm overseeing the environmental study. I'm sure many of you, um, if not everyone, is well acquainted with the progress that has been made on Bangor Highway over the past 10 years. Continuing on this progress, UDOT has recently started multiple state environmental studies to evaluate converting all the remaining signalized intersections on Bangor Highway to freeway style interchanges. Tonight's meeting will focus on Bangor Highway and 9800 South. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to introduce the study and gather feedback about overall transportation needs and environmental issues that should be considered as we move through the process and the study. The input we receive will help the team develop and refine a preferred alternative or design concept that will be available for public comment later in the study process. So tonight, no specific designs or property impacts will be shown. A recording of tonight's online meeting will be available on the study website tomorrow for anyone who want to review it or share it with others. 
So what we're talking about tonight is this state environmental study. The state environmental study at 9800 South and Bangor is also known as an SES, is for a state funded project. UDOT conducts an environmental uh, study on all of our projects. Uh, state environmental study is just the title of what this one is. The environmental review process for a state study provides decision makers with the necessary information to make the best project decisions while carefully considering the anticipated benefits and impacts. This process begins with the scoping. Uh, that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, during the scoping phase, we initiate agency coordination. We involve the public in activities like this. Uh, we gather information about the area, what resources, the history of the area. Um, we gather data, traffic data, environmental data. It helps us to establish our study goals. And the scoping process um, is really important for us to be able to understand what is important to you, the residents in the area. So the process is followed by the development of the design concepts where we look at alternatives that may be better suited to the area. Uh, we screen and we des develop screening metrics to determine which uh, solutions will be best during this phase. Uh, the design concepts are screened for things like their ability to meet the project goals, uh, the impacts to the natural and built environments. So um, both the, the human built environment as we're part of nature, we're part of the environment and, uh, and the natural environment such as the any water resources, air quality, noise, those sort of things that may be impacted. We also consider the engineering cons uh, costs and capabilities. And basically, can we build what we, what we want to build with the budget that we have? Once a particular, particular design concept goes through the screening process and is selected the, as the preferred design, our team will evaluate the environmental resources within and adjacent to the impact area of that uh, design concept. At that point, the state environmental study document will be drafted. When the draft is ready, we'll come back. We'll have, hold another public hearing to give, the, give you another chance to review uh, what's been uh, brought forward in the study and offer any additional feedback for our team to address. We'll look at thing, uh, we'll be able to look at the design and provide any sort of comments on the design that we've uh, brought forward so that uh, you can be as informed as possible. Once everything's been completed and all the requirements have been met, the SES will be finalized. Uh, once this area has been environment, environmentally cleared, we can move on to the next phase of the effort, which is design and, and construction. Tonight's meeting is the first of many points of contact that you can expect to see from our team throughout the environmental study. Uh, make sure to visit our website, udot.utah.gov slash 9800 south and sign up for any updates if you haven't already to make sure you're receiving the latest and greatest information. We really do want to hear from you. Please feel free to reach out to our team any point throughout the study. Uh, we, we, it, it does help to inform the process. The purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, the purpose of this pro proposed project is to improve safety, increase mobility by replacing the traffic signals at 9800 South with a freeway style inter interchange. Grade separating these facilities will reduce travel times for dri drivers on Bangor Highway and for drivers on 9800 South. In addition, it will reduce the number and severity of crashes by eliminating high speed conflict points. It is no secret that Utah is growing. By 2050, the design year for this study, traffic is expected to double from the current rate of 60,000 vehicles per day to 120,000 vehicles per day. Without making major improvements on Bangor and 9800 South, projections have estimated that, to delay, that delays could increase by nearly four times. That being said, uh, this is our study area that we're looking at for this project. Uh, this doesn't in mean that everything in this area is going to be impacted directly or taken or anything like that. Uh, this just shows the area that we're going to be studying for environmental impacts. Uh, gives you an idea of where we're gonna be considering uh, things such as air quality, noise, water resources, all of those uh, resources that may be impacted. And, 
throughout the entire process. This slide shows the schedule and accompanying milestones. The orange represents study milestones and the gray represents public coordination milestones. But as Tyler has mentioned, feel free to reach out at any time to the project team through the hotline, website, email, or even mail. So we're currently on the left side conducting a public meeting to better inform our concept development process. Once the preferred design has been selected, UDOT will hold neighborhood meetings to notify impacted residents and businesses to discuss the path forward. The selected design concept will then be presented to the public for formal comment and review. UDOT will then review these comments and respond to them and may adjust the design as needed. The state environmental study process will then be finalized and the project will move into the next phase, contractor procurement, um, purchasing of right-of-way and construction in 2023. Construction is expected to take a year and a half to two years. One unique feature of this project is the pedestrian bridge uh, that, that goes over Bangadur. Uh, the structure will, will most likely be impacted if we if there's any major roadway changes uh, due to its proximity to the roadway and just the change in the elevation. Uh, so as part of this project, we are looking and working very closely with the Jordan School District, Elk Ridge Middle School, Elk Meadows Elementary School, and eventually the entire school community council to discuss how to get students safely across Bangor, both during and after construction. Another unique feature of this area is the Jordan Valley Aqueduct that runs along the east side of Bangor. This is a 78 inch aqueduct, it's really large, provides water to more than a million people across Salt Lake County and the surrounding area. As we develop different concepts, we will evaluate how each design impacts this critical utility. Relocating the aqueduct is expensive and may result in additional property impacts. If the aqueduct were to be, were to be relocated, it would add an additional year to the project. Like I mentioned earlier, we are still in the very early stages of the environmental study. We are hoping to hear what, what items are important to you to help us move the study forward. Here are some possible interchange concepts that our team plans to investigate as we move forward with the study. We have put together some very high level figures to communicate how each of these type of interchange function. These figures are generic and are not to scale. These are not specific to 9800 South and Bangor Highway and do not indicate impacts or the direction the department's moving. So shown on the screen is a, a tight diamond interchange. A tight diamond interchange is commonly used where traffic volumes are lower. Each set of on and off ramps is controlled by its own traffic signal. This interchange can be configured so all movements are signal controlled, making it safer for pedestrians. We are currently reviewing traffic data to determine if a diamond interchange can support growth projections and function all the way to 2050, the design year for this project. A single point urban, urban interchange or a SPUI is efficient at moving high volumes of traffic and is the type of interchange used at other grade separated Bangor locations. As shown in this picture, there is typically one signal that controls all directions of travel. We are looking at the traffic data here to determine if a SPUI is required to address the 2050 traffic projections. The no access option would remove all access to Bangor from 9800 South. We will evaluate how removing access impacts traffic on nearby intersections and roads. We will also analyze how to safely maintain traffic during construction if this option were to move forward. In addition to these interchange types, we'll also be evaluating in partnership with the South Jordan City, if Bangor Highway will go over or under 9800 South. 
However, I want to note that to date, UDOT has not been able to proceed with the under option in the past when the aqueduct parallels Bangor Highway like it does here due to significant increase in property impacts, cost, and schedule. Likewise, we'll also be looking into shifting Bangor to the east, the west, or slightly in both directions. As with every environmental study, we will also analyze what would happen to traffic and mobility if no changes were made at 9800 South and Bangor. I do want to point out I do want to point out how the final design will be determined as a result of the study and what information goes into the de decision making process. Environmental studies like the one we are conducting now determine the best possible solution based on a wide variety of factors like engineering standards, traffic data, environmental resources, public feedback, budget, and coordination with key government and environmental agencies. The final, the final decision is not determined by a public vote. However, please keep in mind that public input is valued and considered in this process and is a very important element. So please help us understand how your community transportation, help us understand your community's transportation environmental needs. So now that you've heard what we're looking at and what we're studying, please let us know what you think. We have a variety of outreach channels set up to allow you to provide your feedback and we do welcome input at any point throughout the study. We do, however, have our first formal comment period open now through August 13th. What that means is any comment received during that period will be included in the final environmental document and there will be another opportunity to provide formal input later on in the study once we have a preferred design and that's been developed and presented at the public hearing. So please call, email, visit our website, mail in a comment form, tell us how you use the road. Do you walk or drive or bike or in the area? Do you use the pedestrian bridge? How often do you see people use it? We want to know about this. We're looking for information about potential environmental considerations that we might not have addressed yet with the study or the project in general. We're also looking for feedback so we can make sure that the solution we develop is right fit for this area. Any comments submitted tonight through the Q&A are not considered formal comments. So if you do wish to make a formal comment, please remember to send it in by August 13th using one of those these resources on the screen right now. Perfect. Thanks so much for that information, Brian and Tyler. We've been keeping an eye on the questions coming in. We've got quite a few and would encourage you guys who are on the line to continue to submit those through the Q&A box. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a panel of experts here on the line to field these questions. Um, we'll go ahead and get started on what we've got so far. And actually, I think really the most popular question that we're seeing right now from a couple of different people, S. Hader, Danner Banks, and Jennifer Brown have asked about the option of having 9800 South be just an east-west overpass and not have access there. I think Brian covered that a little bit in the uh, possible solutions that he went through. But if you want to touch on that a little bit more, Brian, and maybe Macy, we can switch back to that slide really quick, just to let the folks know that that is something that's being considered and any additional feedback you'd like to have there, Brian. Yes, yeah, so there's a number of considerations that have to go into each alternative. Um, and I will give a provide uh, just a high level overview and I'll let each, uh, we have a, a bunch of extremely qualified engineers here that can um, dive into more detail. So we are looking at if access was not provided at 9800 South and Bangor, how that would impact the system east and west and north and south of here. So the design horizon for this project is, is 2050. So we're looking at how these no access would impact here or how no access here would impact those intersections, those streets in 2050. In addition, we're looking if you were to take 9800 South over Bangor, how that would affect access east and um, east and west of here. In addition, there's a there's the aqueduct, which is um, very challenging in that I don't believe they currently allow um, large structures. There is pedestrian bridges over the, the aqueduct, but that would that would be a significant challenge negotiating that with the, the federal government. Um, in addition, we're looking at taking Bangor Highway over 9800 South. Um, it, we're looking at what that would require to maintain traffic. Um, do you have anything to add, Ivan or Dustin? I kind of dove into a little more detail than I thought, but. 
I can elaborate a little bit on the, the traffic side of things. I'm uh, one of the traffic engineers working on the project. Uh, as Brian mentioned, we're analyzing what happens to some of the, the overall system in the area. So we're basically looking at the area from 90th South down to 104th South or South Jordan Parkway and from 40th West to 3200 West. So that, that rectangle it's about a mile wide and about two miles tall. We're looking at all the signalized intersections in there, looking at, at 2050 conditions like Brian mentioned, with and without an interchange at 9800 South to see what the effect would be on those adjacent intersections, um, you know, for both conditions. And so that's, that's what our analysis will consider as we evaluate this interchange from, a, or the, the potential for it interchange versus no interchange at 9800 South. Thanks, Ivan. Um, did Justin or Dustin want to add anything or did we cover the, the roadway elements sufficiently? Yeah, I think, I think you covered it. You know, when you take 98th over, um, you have um, accesses and driveways that are closer to Bangor that uh, could be impacted. But yeah, that's something definitely we're going to evaluate um, as part of the study. Thanks, Justin. Okay, perfect. Our next question that is coming in is from Eileen Kennedy. Um, it's kind of in the same vein. So I'm wondering, Brian and Justin, if you guys can plan to tackle this one as well. Eileen is wondering if Bangadur can be lowered, um, like we've seen at other locations along the corridor at 114th and 104th South, instead of being raised. So can you guys explain a little bit about the considerations when making that type of decisions? Yeah, this is this might piggyback a little bit on what uh, Brian had already mentioned, but you know, the, in the question, the examples of, of Bangor going under is what you see at 114th South and what is being constructed at 104th South. And for Bangor to go under, the type of retaining walls that are required or require rod-like anchors that go back into the soil. And these soil nails can extend into the ground about 30 to 40 feet. The zone for these soil nails need to be free of utilities. Otherwise, there's a high likelihood that these would be damaged. So at 9800 South, where we have the aqueduct running parallel to Bangor on the east side, uh, it sits inside a 50-foot easement that's owned by the Bureau of Reclamation. And the soil nails are not allowed in this easement. So it would, it would make it more difficult for Bangor to go under. Uh, Bangor would have to either shift to the west more or the aqueduct would have to be relocated further to the east. Um, but it's something definitely that uh, we're going to develop a profile for Bangor to go under at this location and evaluate it. Perfect. Thank you, Justin. Great. So our next question is coming in from Robin Schneider. This might be a good one for Ivan, our traffic representative. So Robin asks, with 104th South traffic being diverted to 98th South, it seems like you cannot accurately assess traffic patterns. Was any data captured prior to 104th South closing for this effort? Yeah, I can answer that. That's a very astute question because that is a very legitimate and real concern that uh, we've had to deal with um, in this area. Because unfortunately, you know, uh, at, you know, with 104th under construction and in particular closed to east-west traffic, that's really affected travel patterns in the area. So in this case, we were fortunate enough to do our initial counts in April before 104th was closed to east-west. But we also have some previous data that was collected here um, from, that, from that 104th south interchange project where they had, they had counted 9,800 South. Um, and so we have some prior data, we had some recent data. And so between those, we uh, and then we were able to look at adjacent intersections as well. Uh, some of the intersections have some automated traffic data associated with them that is stored. So we were able to look at some historic data that way. So we were able to really 
use all this different data sources, put them all together and come up with a, a kind of a composite traffic volume that we felt represented uh, traffic conditions basically before the pandemic and before uh, before construction on Bangadar, but it, it was a challenge, but it is one that we, we realized would be a challenge and have put quite a bit of effort into getting uh, what we feel to be reasonable and accurate traffic volumes. Great, thanks Ivan. Okay, perfect. Our next question comes from Chris and Chris is wondering why um, Elk Meadows Elementary wasn't included in the study area for this project. Um, seeing that it's pretty close to the corridor. I'm wondering, Tyler, um, if that's something you could talk to us about a little bit. Sure. Uh, the study area is for the impacts that we uh, are looking at for air, noise, those sort of impacts that are more directly re related to the construction. As you can see on the screen, Elk Meadows is in the study area. It just isn't highlighted with the green line around it. We will be looking at traffic impacts uh, safe routes to schools, those, those sort of things with the school district to make sure that we are accounting for the, the elementary school as well. Uh, one thing I should mention about the green line, it, is, it isn't a solid. It is a fluid line. It can change throughout the process. Uh, to account for inf information or changes in, in the area that we might not be aware of at the very beginning or, or we think that really does need to be included, we need to draw the green line around it and make sure that we're looking at everything else with it, but with this study area, it it has some uh, some flexibility to it, is what I'm saying. So, thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Tyler. Brian, did you have something to add to that one? Yeah. So this project is really focused on being kind of like addressing the issue at Bangor Highway 9800 South, um, and sure, I'm removing the signal and great separating these facilities. We don't anticipate significant amount of constructions construction east or west of Bangor Highway and 9800 South Interchange too, if that makes sense. Perfect, thank you. Okay, our next question here is from Kurt. The question is, so how many houses are you going to take to do this? Brian Allen, do you wanna start us off on that answer? Yeah, thank you. So tonight we are develop, we're having a public open house to better understand the community needs and the, the different considerations that should be taken forward as we move forward with the study and develop different alternatives. So we currently do not have the impacts identified as we do not currently have a, a preferred design um, selected yet. We're still in the process of developing those designs. We do have a follow-up question on that one. Well, a related question that I think ties in well here. What is the timeline looking ahead for when those impacts will be identified and communicated to the public? Yeah, Brian Atkinson, do you want to go over the, the project schedule? Yeah, thanks. I'd be happy to. So um, as we pull up that graph that we showed earlier um, in our presentation, um, our plan is to, you know, we're meeting tonight to get some input and some feedback from, from all of you and then uh, we'll be developing concepts uh, based on the feedback that we get to tonight and then evaluating those concepts and, and looking at all the, uh, the associated impacts with those. And then uh, after that, we'll be going back out uh, to the public for our neighborhood meetings, like we mentioned in October, November. And that's really the first time when we're gonna be disclosing uh, who is impacted by, by what we're recommending as our uh, concept that we want to move forward with with the study. So yeah, watch for those meetings and we'll be, you know, reaching out the same way we've done for this meeting to let everybody know when they're going to occur. And then after we've met with those that are impacted, we're doing our public hearing um, at the beginning of the year when all of the public can come to see what those impacts are and, and who will be impacted. Awesome, thank you, Brian, appreciate that follow-up. All right, perfect. So our next question coming in is from Zachary and he wants to know, are you exploring the widening of 98 South to Redwood Road? 
Um, seems like that would be considered if the amount of traffic will continue to increase over the next 30 years. So Brian and maybe Ivan, is that something you guys can talk a little bit about the um, possibility of extending 98th to Redwood or the um, traffic projections? Yeah, I can certainly jump in there if you don't mind, Brian. Oh, go ahead. Um, so I guess the short answer is, is no, we're not considering uh, widening 9800 South. And that's driven by regional uh, transportation plans that are developed um, in partnership with the cities and UDOT, other transportation agencies. Every four years, a, a new long range transportation plan is developed for the entire region that includes you know, uh, projects all types of transportation projects, including transit and trails and whatnot. And that plan does not include 9800 South being widened. Um, and so we use that plan as a guide. And so because that night widening 9800 South is not in the plan, it's not uh, something that we're, we're evaluating either. Um, I should also mention that both 90th South and 100th Fourth or South Jordan Parkway are both in the plan to be widened to seven lanes. And so both of those roads are expected to see some pretty substantial increases in volume over time. But on 9800 South, we're not, from at least from our preliminary numbers, we're not seeing a lot of growth on 9800. And part of that is because it doesn't have good connectivity to the West where a lot of the growth is happening. And so it, uh, you know, a lot of that, that growth farther west doesn't have a good route to get to 9800 south. And then, you know, 9800 south is largely a built out corridor with not, a, with, a, with not a lot of vacant land left to develop. And so because of those, we're not seeing a need to have 9800 be widened either. Perfect, thanks Ivan. Okay, there's a couple of questions coming in that are somewhat related. I'm going to kind of combine these and see if we can address a few elements. Um, the overall sentiment is kind of asking about, you know, how are we going to affect schools with an interchange versus no access? I'm wondering if we could do a little bit, maybe this is something, Brian Atkinson, you could talk a little bit about how we're working with the school district and the local schools throughout the process. Let's tackle that first. And then we'll go into some of the additional pieces of this question. Yeah, these are all great questions and, and understand how that affects you and, and, and the children here in this area. So um, we currently have been uh, holding uh, some initial meetings with, with the Jordan School District. Uh, we've been meeting with some of their staff that are involved with transportation and just their uh, emergency services um, involved with the school district. And then in those meetings, we also have had the principal for both the elementary school and for um, the middle school there for the, for Elk Ridge and Elk Meadows. And so um, we're using that, those meetings and we're, we're planning to meet with them monthly to uh, start looking at and addressing this uh, the challenge of how do we get kids back and forth across Bangor for the people that live on each side of Bangor and go to each one of these schools. And so um, as we meet with them, uh, and again, we're just barely started and had an, some initial meetings so far, but but as we meet with them, we'll, we'll show them some of the concepts we're developing and, and we'll specifically look at how we're going to safely uh, take those kids from one side to the other and, and relocating that pedestrian bridge um, will definitely be part of, of, of some of the concepts that we look at there. Thank you, Brian, I appreciate that. A second piece of this, I'm wondering if we have any information, Brian Allen, this feels like a project management question. Um, Randy had asked in his question, how many millions of dollars would it save if there was no access? Can you give us some insight into what we're looking at in terms of cost in the relation to these options as well? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And 
So we're currently, as I talked about, our, our planning horizon is 2050. So we're looking at how these impacts um, of not providing access will impact these intersections. Um, and if an intersection is warranted here um, from a traffic perspective. So that's our, our first box that we're, we're checking off and looking at just um, what does the traffic numbers and data say. Now the second one we're looking at is um, if we take 9800 South over Bangator, Bangator over 9800 South, what are the requirements in order to maintain traffic during construction and how that impacts the adjacent business owners and homes. Um, so those are the two different items that we're looking at as we as we move forward to determine if, if access is needed at Bangor 9800 South. Um, does anyone have any on the panel? Does anyone else have any addition uh, they would like to additional information they would like to add? Okay, thank you, Brian. Perfect. It looks like we had a question come in that I'm going to send over to um, Tyler and Sam from our environmental team. Um, the, this person's wondering what are the noise impacts or increases or decreases that are associated with an over option versus an under option? It's a good question, but with sound, it, it, the, the answer comes back to it depends. It moves the impact, really, is what happens with the noise. So an over option, you have it going over the sides, dispersed that way. But when you go under, it acts more like a canyon and kind of funnels it out. So we, you may have noticed in the past week or so, uh, we'll have, we had individuals go out and do noise studies uh, for pre-construction. Uh, and um, so we can get the before impacts of the noise. What we'll do with that information is we run it through models and we use each of the designs that we're we are drawing up right now uh, to determine where those impacts are, uh, what sort of noise mitigation may be warranted in each area, and uh, how that mitigation may affect uh, if we go over or under, and where we can place those walls according to the, the aqueduct, where it is located. So there's a lot to go into it, but the general idea is uh, with the an over versus an under, it just changes the location of those those impacts. Sam, do you have anything to add? I think you covered it. Okay, I've got a question here that I'm hoping Justin on our design team can help us address. I think this is something that Brian mentioned in his uh, presentation that we'll cover a little bit further. Eileen asks, has it been considered to move Bangator more west away from the aqueduct so that it can go under 9800 south? Um, she mentions having the school lose a wing and have to rebuild on the west side of the school is what she's referring to. Yeah, so that's a great question. So we definitely look at those types of uh, ideas when we develop concepts. We we're, and as we develop a, a concept where we shift further to the west, we, we just take an inventory of all the impacts uh, that we have with that concept. And then we, we try to do a, a screening criteria for each of our concepts to, to just find out which concept has the least amount of impacts. So we definitely will go through that process and try to find the best solution that minimizes impacts. Perfect. Thanks, Justin. Okay, perfect. Another question that we have coming up um, is from Natalie, who is uh, wondering about the safety of residents and especially children going to schools in the area and how that's being considered as part of this process, um, especially with the potentially increased traffic that might come from, from a new interchange. So Brian, is that something you could start us out on? Yeah, I can discuss it a little bit. I, I believe Brian Atkinson covered this in, in detail. Um, but as he mentioned, we're coordinating with the, el the elementary and middle school um, principals and, and personnel from the district and transportation and other divisions to ensure that we um, come up with a solution that really helps facilitate the safe transportation or you know the walking of children to and from school obviously that's a critical um, critical element um, Bangor Highway is a busy road um, 
that we really are taking. I mean, safety, zero fatalities is one of UDOT's main objectives, right? So this is something we're taking very seriously and coordinating it and taking a significant amount of time looking into. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you covering that again. Okay. This is a question about the city of South Jordan and how they are involved in this. Tim asks, is the city of South Jordan contributing to the construction costs? If so, has the city given any preference for under overpass or other options for this interchange? Brian, you've been leading the charge and kind of coordinating with the city from a UDOT perspective. Do you want to start off there? Yes, we have been coordinating with uh, South Jordan we with them monthly. Um, we're currently developing the over and under alternatives. Um, as discussed before, we look at the impacts with each alternative and the cost difference. And we, we work with the cities to determine um, how that delta will be made up. Um, we have not calculated that delta or had the opportunity to um, select a final design yet. We're here uh, discussing what we need to take into account. So that conversation is, is ongoing with South Jordan. I think we'll have a lot more discussions once we have those those figures my understanding right now though is, is south jordan is not as interested in taking the the interchange under this location brian could you explain quickly what a delta is that you're referring to the, the difference for example and these are just numbers i'm using as an example i mean if it costs 100 million to build a standard intersection over, and it costs 150 million to take the interchange under, a delta between those options would be 50 million. Perfect, thanks for that clarification. All right, so our next question coming in um, is about the weight that the public feedback and comments that we're soliciting tonight has in this process as we make a decision. Um, so Brian, can you just talk a little bit about um, how much influence the public's opinion and feedback has on the process and how that's incorporated as we move um, further through design. Yeah, thank you. So UDOT is a state agency and we look at regional mobility and making sure that you know, people get to and from their workplace or their family uh, safely. So public input is, is a very important step in the process. Um, however, as I mentioned in the presentation, it, it is not the only step. We will also look at the, the different costs associated with the different alternatives, the different impacts, and we take all these items into consideration as we move forward with um, selecting a preferred alternative. Brian Atkinson, is there anything else you'd like to like to add to that, or kind of? Yeah, no, I think you covered that well, Brian. Okay, we've got a question here coming in from Jason. The original South Jordan master plan did not have 9800 South crossing Bangator, but Merritt Medical insisted for access to the golf course. Can we just cap the intersection per the original plan? Is that something that Brian Allen, you can take originally for UDOT from your perspective? Yeah. Um... That is something we're not looking at currently in our attractive traffic modeling. I mean, that's something I think we can add to um, our analysis and look at. So thank you for that comment. Okay, perfect. Another question that we have coming in um, has to do with pedestrian access and crossings. Um, Lucas is wondering if it's being considered to add a sky bridge or pedestrian crossing at Bangator at 102 South um, to kind of help connect the east and west neighborhoods for pedestrians. Is that something we're looking at as part of this project? Brian, sorry, sending that one to you. Um, that is currently uh, not included in this project. This project is focused on 98th and, and Bangator. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. I think that might address something on a kind of a related note. Lacey had asked, what are you doing with 102? She says it goes all the way up to daybreak. It seems like there that would make more sense since this is where your traffic is going to come from. Sounds like Lacey is asking 
what, if anything, we're planning to do with the with 102nd South. I think, Brian, your answer, this study is really looking at 9800 South to remove the existing signals at that intersection and grade separate that intersection. Anything else to add for Lacey? No, I, I sent us an email though, and we can like, look into that a little bit more. I... Okay, for sure. Let's see, we're going through these questions. We've got about 15 minutes of our schedule time left. Um, so we're going through and trying to combine some things, make sure we're touching on all these topics. If you're submitting questions, go ahead and look through that answered column to see if what you what you want to ask may have already been answered. That will kind of help us um, pare these down just a little bit, but we're happy to see so many people with questions being engaged here. Thank you for that. Okay, perfect. So it looks like, Katie, we have a question coming in from Robin. I'm hoping um, maybe Brian and possibly Ivan, you guys could speak to this a little bit. Can you share what growth is expected by 2050 um, for 98 South um, and talk a little bit about the, the traffic numbers we're seeing in the area? Yeah, Ivan, do you want to cover this one? Yep, I can do this. So uh, you're absolutely right in that we're not seeing a lot of growth on this road because um, it is a largely built out area and because 9800 South doesn't extend very far to the west. And so by 2050, we're seeing relatively modest volume increases. I think, I don't recall right offhand, but I believe it's in the neighborhood of maybe 20% or so, uh, not, not, very, not a very large number. I, much of 9800 South, I think, currently carries in the neighborhood of 10,000 cars a day. And so they, that might be up into the you know, 12,000 car a day range by 2050, so so pretty modest, especially when compared to like a 90th South or, or a 104th South, which are projected to be carrying in the neighborhood of you know, 45 to 50,000 cars a day by, by 2050. Perfect, thanks Ivan, appreciate it. Okay, let's see. David Pratt is asking, and I think this might be a good question for Brian Atkinson, who's been involved in some of this in the past. David asked, UDOT has moved aqueducts at 6200 South. Which way would you move the aqueduct if it is proposed to move it? Yeah, you're right. Uh, both at 6200 South and at 5400 South, UDOT's moved the aqueduct previously. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to look at both ways here. Uh, a very likely way would to beat them to move it further east. Uh, currently it's on the east side of Bangor and by moving it further east that uh, would uh, you know align with where it's at today and, and be efficient way of getting it out of the way. Um, we could also look at crossing Bangor and uh, putting on the on the west but that that's going to probably require more relocation to, to just cross it to the other side. But, but we'll be looking at all that. Uh, um, but most likely it would be move it to the east. That's the most likely place we would look at relocating it to. Yeah, the aqueduct is contained in what's called an easement, a 50 foot easement. And it doesn't allow any structures in it. And the aqueduct meanders a lot being uh, a lot along Bingeter Highway. It's not always on the east side, it's not always on the west side, sometimes it's in the middle. And in order to build a structure, sometimes we have to relocate the aqueduct. Um, All right, so this is a question about some traffic data. So Ivan, I'll send this back to you. Um, Chris is wondering what the time frame, nature and scope of the traffic data we're using is, especially with the ongoing um, work happening at 106 South. Um, Chris is wondering essentially if that closure is inflating our data and what accommodations we're making to make sure that the data we have is accurate. Yeah, this is a very, a very good question. Uh, and one that we're aware of. Uh, so we were able to collect our initial traffic data before the 104th interchange 
closed to east-west traffic and to left turns. And so we were able to get some, um, some data before that. But we also were able to get, use some data from a few years ago, from before the pandemic, before construction. Uh, I also look at some data from adjacent intersections and from some automated um, volume data that, that UDOT collects at traffic signals. And really we put all that together and we're able to generate what we felt to be a, a good, reasonable, reliable existing volume set on which to, to grow future. So uh, we feel pretty confident that we've, we've got a, a reasonable volumes, but yeah, it, it took a little bit of work because there's a lot going on there that have made some of the, the most more recent data uh, somewhat suspect, but yeah, thank you for your question. Perfect, thanks so much, Ivan. We have a question from Stephen James that I think Justin would be great to start off with. Stephen says 98th has a great bike connection. How will it be maintained or enhanced? So the study um, in the environmental document, that's one thing that we do cover. We look at uh, active transportation routes and uh, we'll make environmental commitments to uh, make sure that those active transportation um, elements are included and are accommodated. You know, if we have to make a bridge a little bit longer to accommodate uh, bike lanes or something like that, we make sure that we accommodate that um, with our with our concepts. Thanks, Justin. Appreciate it. All right, so we have another question coming in from Angelo. Um, Angelo is wondering, could another option be to allow exits and on ramps at 98 South without left turns? So more of a right in, right out type of option. Brian, is that something that the, the team is considering at this location? Yes, um, that is something we'll, we will evaluate. Perfect, thank you. And then maybe just as a follow up, Justin, is there any information you could give us on that kind of no left turn option, things that we're looking at and considering that might make that um, a contender or not so much at 98? Yeah, that's that's definitely a, uh, a concept that uh, we have kind of floated out there is, is uh, one that we would look at. One of the elements with the, I guess you'd call it a right in, right out type of a uh, of an option would be how to get uh, the traffic to be able to make a left turn, uh, you know, eventually down one east or west of, of 9800 south. And so, you know, it, whether that's a through turn option or a roundabout option, um, we, we've kind of looked at that a little bit. We're going to continue to evaluate that. We don't think that that might, you know, we don't think that would be the, maybe the best solution, but it's definitely something that we're evaluating. Perfect. Thanks so much, Justin. Okay, we've got another question that I think we're still, of course, taking a look at in this early stage. But the question is coming in from Emily. She's asking, as part of this, will 9800 South be widened? If so, will you take a bunch of my backyard and or will a sound wall be built along the back fences of those properties along 9800 South? So the cross street rather than bang it earth. Is that something, Brian Allen, you wanna start? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so this project is really focused on bang it or highway 9800 South and grade separating those two facilities. So we, we are definitely gonna limit our improvements along 9800 South to make it compatible with Bangadur Highway. So I don't see um, a lot of improvements being done to 9800 South. I did see some requests to lengthen the time. So that's something we could lengthen a little bit, but we also have a, an open house tomorrow in person. Um, so if you're, we're not able to get all the through all the questions today, feel free to attend that tomorrow. Thanks, Brian. Great point. We're, we're hustling, trying to get through them all. These are really good questions. Really quick, um, before I jump over to Duke, there was one question that got put into the answered column. I think we addressed it slightly, 
but it's one that I think Tyler would like to address from our environmental group. David Yeager had asked, you said that the public does not get a vote. How much weight will public opinion carry? And he asked 20%, 50%, 2%. Tyler, do you wanna go ahead and expand upon that just so that we're very clear that we answered that question? Yes, so percentage doesn't really apply in this situation. Uh, we do take public in, public involvement seriously. We want to hear from the public. We wanna know what how you use the area, what uh, you would like to see. And then we try to accommodate that with the, within the bounds of our project goals. We try to make sure that we can build what needs to be built, as well as address the, the needs of the environment of the people in the area, as well as commuters. So when you ask what, what percentage will be, that's kind of where we're saying that it's not really a vote thing. It's we're trying to, to amalgamate as much information as we can, both internally and from the public to make sure we're, we're answering those, those concerns. Awesome, thank you, Tyler. We're just talking a little bit behind the scenes, looking at what we've still got coming in. I think we'll be able to extend about 15 minutes or so to try to get through some more of these questions. Like Brian mentioned, this definitely isn't the only way to talk with us and get questions answered, but we wanna be sure we're doing what we can to address things. So we'll go forward a little bit for those of you who can stay past seven. Perfect. So we'll try and combine two questions here. It looks like we have one in from Tyson and one from Paul. They're both wondering um, kind of what's the timeline for when we'll actually know a little bit more about impacts and um, who, which properties will be impacted, which won't, when we'll have a final decision. Can we just jump back to that schedule piece a little bit and, and look ahead? Brian Allen, is that something you can talk about? Yeah. So this is the initial phase of the, the environmental study. We're having this, this open house to make sure that we're evaluating everything we need to evaluate as we move forward with the study. So right now we're in the concept development and screening phase. So as we move forward and develop different concepts and gain more information, we'll, we'll develop a, a preferred alternative, which will um, show um, to impacted residents at a neighborhood meeting to, to enable them to ask questions about the process moving forward. And then we'll present the, the final SES or state environmental study document for formal public hearing and the beginning of next year. Construction is expected to start in 2023. Perfect, thanks for covering that, Brian. So this question, um, let's see, we've got Sorry, just making sure I combine a couple of these from Randy. Um, Randy's just sharing kind of his thoughts about that no access piece again. Wondering, Brian Allen, is there any estimated cost at this point of a no access intersection? I think you touched on that a bit before, but that's something that's coming in a couple of times. No, we, we just begin developing the different concepts. And as I mentioned before, we're, we're in, we're, uh, started to look at the traffic. Ivan's starting to, to dive into that and we're starting to lay out the no access option. One item just to keep in mind is just because there's no access um, post-construction, you have to maintain um, you have to maintain traffic flow during construction. So we're looking at what it takes to maintain traffic during construction um, in addition to what the final design would look like. Great, thanks, Brian. Okay, perfect. We have a question here um, from Terry that I'm gonna pass over to you, Brian, but feel free to loop in the group because um, I think it could maybe touch on a few different areas. Terry's wondering, um, there are several critical healthcare, dental, veterinary facilities at this intersection. Um, and some of these services are already pretty limited in the area. Um, and so Terry's just wondering, um, is the necessity of these services for the community being taken into account in this study when we're looking at um, impacts and, and things of that nature? We definitely develop our alternatives with the mindset of trying to reduce impacts. Um, we understand that um, impacts are, are not fun for anyone, right? Um, so we really t approach this with the mindset that you know, how can we accomplish these project goals of you know, keeping this a safe intersection, an efficient intersection, um, all while um, reducing impacts to the, the businesses and residents along the corridor. 
um, whenever we do impact a, um, a business such as that or a resident, we have a, a special process that we could go through to help them find a, a new business um, place and or home. We do have, if we want to go into detail on that, we do have a right away specialist with the department, Eric. He can talk a little bit about relocation of businesses and or homeowners, or you could come to the open house and, and get a more uh, detailed explanation in person. Um, with, the with the limited time, maybe we'll save that to the end um, and come back to it. Perfect, thanks, Brian. Tim has a question about whether or not there is a map of the current aqueduct available. Tim, we do have some figures available for where the aqueduct goes through this location, as well as the easement that the Bureau of Reclamation has over the top of that aqueduct as well. So it's just the aqueduct alignment plus the easement that um, kind of dictates what can and can't be done in that area. So that's something that we have in our slides here today. We've also will have posted at our meeting tomorrow, um, but we'll make sure that we get that to you so you can see that cross that section just a little bit better. All right, perfect. So our next question comes from Jason and has to do with noise. So again, I'll probably pass this over to you, Tyler, and you, Sam. Um, for locations that we've seen along the corridor that have had an overpass um, installed on the over top of the east and west street, is there a report available that kind of shows the change in noise level for those neighborhoods in that area? Currently, we do not at UDOT do post-construction uh, noise studies to it's just not something that's been done here. Uh, what we do use is because uh, computer models that should that have been very accurate and been been used for years and years now to be able to, to model what the what the increased noise would be for these locations, and then use those to determine locations of uh, mitigation uh, or noise walls, those sort of things. Perfect. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate it. Okay, next one here. We've talked a little bit about this. Um, how do you decide between no access and access? And Eagle Bee asked that. Is that something that, Brian, you can reiterate the types of things we're looking at for that option? Yeah. Um, so we're looking at how, if we if access was to be terminated, right? We'd look how that, and Ivan's covered this in detail. So if, if you weren't able to catch that, I would encourage you to view this recording and go back and watch what Ivan covered. In addition, you can come to talk to Ivan tomorrow. Again, we'll be looking at if no access was provided at this intersection, how that would affect intersections north and south, east and west. And if that would um, cause those intersections to fail, meaning having the delay times be in excess of what we consider acceptable. Um, and there's a big detailed explanation and we can go over that at a different time about level of service and signal timing and about how we go about analyzing the, the different signal performance measures. In addition, we're looking at the, the volumes, the numbers of, of vehicles on the roads um, in addition to the traffic signal performance. And we'll also be looking at what it takes to, as I discussed before, maintain traffic um, and what those impacts will be compared to a conventional interchange that would be built here. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that recap. Our next question comes to us from Diane. And um, Justin, I'm thinking this might be a good one for you. Diane's curious if the over-under option would necessitate um, us moving the aqueduct. So I was wondering if you could kind of explain that a little bit, if that is true, why or why not? So, it, it very, there, it's a good potential if, if Bangor went under at 9,800 South, um, there is a potential that, yeah, the aqueduct would have to be shifted over just for that additional width for the soil now walls for the, um, for the retaining walls for that option. So that's, that's kind of basically what, what we consider, you know, uh, it's because the aqueduct is, is right up against Bangor. So we don't have a lot of room to, to work with as far as adding additional width for um, those soil nails. Perfect, thanks, Justin. Okay, we've got a question from Richard. Richard is asking, 
is a consideration being taken that there are homes on the west side of 9800 South and that the current situation with speed is a hazard. It sounds like speed on 9800 South currently is a hazard and Richard believes that an exit onto 9800 South would make this condition even more hazardous than it currently is. Um, is there, I mean, maybe this is something that we can have uh, Brian Allen take a stab at first as far as consideration of homes and the speed on 9800 South as part of our study. Yeah, so it sounds like this is kind of falling in the category of, of not providing access, right? Um, Correct. 9800 yeah. South. I think Ivan covered that really, really well, how we don't see a significant increase in volume on 9800 South. And I believe we've kind of outlined our approach on how we're, we're approaching that um, to determine if access is needed on 9800 South. Um, Ivan or anyone else have anything to add? I think we've... One thing also is 9800 South is not a UDOT road, right? And so a lot of those considerations like crossings and those sort of things would be more up to the city. Is that right, Brian? Yeah, it's always, I mean, if there's always um, speeding issues, it's always good. We can talk with the city too. We'll bring this up. Enforcement always helps a lot. And uh, there's different mechanisms you can employ to help, you know, ensure that the facility is safer. Thanks. That's a good point. That speed piece of it, I think, was important to that question. So thank you for addressing that. All right, so our next question comes from Jeffrey. Brian Allen, I'm gonna pass this on to you. Jeffrey is curious if um, home developers have to pay for any of the costs associated with these improvements. Wondering if you could maybe explain for us a little bit the funding piece of a project like this. Yeah, so this is funded through the transportation, I always wanna say investment uh, or improvement. I never, I always get those two mixed up, fund. It's all state funded um, tax dollars. And to be honest, I'm not an expert on tax policy, so I apologize. I mean, I know it's um, from sales of different vehicles and, and gas tax and things like that, but I don't know the details of um, where all that, that we call it the TIF funding comes from. Um, if you do send us an email um, and reach out to us, we can provide that information to you. Does anyone else have any more information on that? I apologize, I'm not. I could maybe add just one other comment, and I'm probably less of an expert in this realm than Brian is, but uh, UDOT is not able to charge impact fees to developers. And so, um, yeah, like Brian said, UDOT, and in particular, this transportation investment fund that he mentioned gets the, the, their money from sales tax and gas tax revenue um, rather than from developers. Uh, only cities are able to charge impact fees to developers. So that's not a, a funding mechanism that the DOT has available to it. Perfect, thanks Ivan, thanks Brian. This next question from Jennifer is one that we've heard a couple of different times as we're meeting with different folks. And I wonder if Brian Atkinson can start us off. Jennifer's asking, does UDOT intend to budget for hazard busing for impacted students during the duration of construction? Yeah, good question. So that that's something that we have done previously on uh, some of our previous uh, Bangor projects. Uh, as we work with the school district, um, we've done that with Granite School District, where um, when the pedestrian bridge had to be uh, removed as part of the construction phasing, um, some busing was provided until the new bridge was put back up. So. Yes, that's something we'll be talking with uh, the Jordan School District about and the, and the principals, like we mentioned in our meetings that we meet with them monthly. Um, don't know if that will happen, but uh, yes, that was something we'll be talking to them about. And, and if needed, that's something we have done and that UDOT has done in the past. Thank you, Brian, appreciate that. Perfect. So our next question comes from Jim. Um, and Jim is curious about the planning of Bangor as a whole. Um, he wants a little bit more information about um, why the impacts are happening the way that they are. Are they all being planned at the same time? Can you give us a little information about the history of planning and the work that goes into that, Brian Allen? I can give you a, an overview of the current environmental studies. Um, 
So currently we're looking at 98th, 134th, and 47th, and those will all be constructed in 2023. Um, we're also conducting an environmental study for 41st to California, and that's all one project. Um, however, it's a multiple environmental studies, and that will be constructed in 2028. And funding for 2700 West is, has yet to be identified. However, we're completing an environmental document for that right now, too. So that's the funding moving forward and the, the environmental study schedule. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. Tyler, did you have something to add to that one? Yeah. So like Brian said, we are looking at all these. Um, some of these are individual documents that we're completing for each of the, the interchanges as a way for construction feasibility and timing. But we are looking at the whole corridor as a whole. So. Uh, it's not just a piecemeal sort of situation. Perfect. And then from my understanding, a lot of that comes from funding. You know, when we're able to secure the funding, we can move forward with the next step in the process. Does that seem accurate? Okay, I'm seeing some shaking heads. So that's always a good sign. Thanks guys. All right, we've got a couple of questions that have come in about property and potential property acquisition. I think it would be good if we could touch on a few of these, Eric, if you're on the line with us. There's a couple of different angles to this. These questions are coming in from Bruce, Eileen, and Roger. Um, the first one, I think, Eric, if you could help us answer, how do you determine the value for the home if you do have to purchase one? All the processes related to acquisition and relocation, uh, potential relocations of property owners and or businesses are heavily regulated by both state and federal laws. And we follow those processes in order to ensure fairness and equitable treatment uh, based on the laws. In general, the properties are appraised for a market value estimate by an independent appraiser. And then a, a offer is made to the property owner. And then we allow a negotiation period of time at which we'll have to work out any details that we need to with the owner. Um, I will be available tomorrow as long as somebody else to answer more specific questions. Uh, there is also a relocation process for owners that, um, for homeowners that may be, if we had to acquire the entire property, there is also a, di a slight difference in that issue related to what we call partial acquisitions. Uh, I, I think there was also some questions related to businesses too. Uh, Brian mentioned earlier. Um, businesses, the relocation process is, is different uh, and we can again explain the details. It's quite lengthy, both processes, but and it would be just easier to explain all that in person. Or certainly we can um, arrange a meeting with you if, if, if you find that your property is affected. Once we get a closer into the fall, we'll probably have a better idea directly who will be affected by any acquisitions. Great, thank you, Eric. This one's slightly related, but might be kind of a combination of a right of way and design question from Roger. Um, follow up is, are impacts to commercial properties given more importance than impacts to residential properties, or are they given equal consideration? I think that's likely something as we're putting together concepts that's more of an applicable kind of topic. Um, let's see, is that Brian Atkinson something you can help us with? Yeah, I can. Can you repeat that question really quick? Yeah, again? absolutely. Are impacts to commercial properties given more importance or consideration than impacts to residential properties, or are they looked at equally? We look at both equally um, and evaluate those uh, together as, as both of those. And so um, part of our evaluation, though, has to do with the cost of that relocation. And, and as you guys know, commercial properties have a higher cost to them. So when we add those together, um, the commercial properties uh, do have that higher cost uh, as part of our evaluation and, and part of our criteria, but, but, they're, but they're lumped together as we look at them. Great, thanks Brian, appreciate it. All right, so I know we're getting close to our time. I think this last question from Kelly would be a good place to wrap up. 
Um, Kelly's curious, what type of feedback and what notes are we really looking for from the public as part of this meeting, from residents, from businesses? What feedback are we looking for um, as, we, as we move forward? So Katie, I think that might be one that, that you could help us answer. Sure, absolutely. So like we mentioned a couple of times, we are looking for feedback about transportation needs in the area, about your community. A lot of what we've heard tonight is exactly what we're looking for. Um, what you're concerned about, what your needs are, what we should be considering as we move forward into the next step, which is really trying to put some ideas and concepts on paper. So exactly what we're kind of hearing tonight, we want to encourage you guys to make sure you're submitting those comments, like Tyler mentioned, to our email address, bangeter at utah.gov, or you can also mail those comments in at any time if you prefer uh, that way. Either way is perfectly fine. So that's what we're looking for. We want to make sure that we're understanding the nuances of the community, the needs that we have, and considering that along with all those other data points that Brian discussed in making a final recommendation for this area. Awesome. Anything Thanks else so to add to that, Tyler or Brian? No, just please do let us know what is important to you in the area. We really do take that into consideration to help to, to guide our goals and our, our project designs. So please reach out. Yes. Okay, perfect. We do appreciate you guys hanging on with us a little bit longer than planned. We've got some additional questions that are still here in the Q&A. The good news is we have a copy of all of those in your email addresses. We can follow up with those things um, and also, again, encourage you, if you're able to, to come and join us tomorrow night. Our team will be there in person at Elk Ridge Middle School from 6 to 730, um, where you can get a whole lot more information and one-on-one -on -one conversation as another option after tonight. So we appreciate it. Another quick reminder, this is a formal comment period. So all of this feedback we're asking for, we would love if you could have that submitted to us by August 13th um, so that it can be included in our environmental document and we have everything kind of in a good spot to review as we move forward with the next steps. So I appreciate everybody. Thank you so much to our panelists as well for all of your help tonight. Um, we're going to go ahead and sign off for now, but we'll be in touch with some follow-up and appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Have a good evening.